From around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. Sponsored by Intel, AWS, and our community partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. I'm John Furrier, your host. We are theCUBE virtual. We're not there in person, we're remote this year and we're excited to cover three weeks of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's virtual events, so they're doing it over three weeks. We're in week three, day two, um, and if you're watching this live on the platform, tomorrow, Thursday at two o'clock, Andy Jassy will be live here on theCUBE with one-on-one -on -one with me to address all, all the hard questions. But here we're doing uh, day two of week three analysis with Jeremy Burton, industry legend, entrepreneur, now the CEO of Observe Inc. Um, formerly the CMO of Dell Technologies, before that EMC, he's done a variety of ventures, seen many ways of innovation. Friend of theCUBE, Jeremy, thank you for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure, great, always great to be on theCUBE. Uh, great to have you on, in particular because um, yesterday, Werner Vogels talked a lot about observability, and I noticed you got your Observe shirt on. Uh, Observe Inc. is your company's name, which is one of the many uh, hot startups around observability where you're making a business out of basically what he talked about yesterday. Um, and in today's keynote, you had the extended cloud uh, edge applications. You had Bill Vass, who leads up both edge and quantum. And then you had Rudy uh, Valdez, who talked a lot about uh, evolution of cloud architecture. And of course, you finally had um, David Richardson, who is the VP of serverless. So you got edge, quantum, serverless architecture. Speaks to the sea change, Jeremy and you have a good read on these big waves. When you look at serverless and then quantum, you look at um, edge, which is data, and you look at um, all this coming together on, on their architecture. Werner's keynote yesterday kind of makes sense. It's a systems architecture and this new observability trend isn't like a point product, it's a broader concept. You have a complete rethinking of distributed computing in the cloud. This is kind of what this Amazon feels like. What's your, what's your take? Yeah, it's a, it's a good observation. You know, the, 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 the sort of punchline is, is that people are building applications differently. Um, so the, 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 the technologies that people are using to build apps are different. Um, the way in which they build applications is different. Um, the way folks release code into production is different. And it, it stands to reason, therefore, you're going to need a different approach uh, when you want to troubleshoot these applications or uh, when you find out, uh, you know, what issue, or when you want to find out what issues customers are having. So what, what we felt a couple, three years ago when we started Observe was that um, a, a new approach was required. What you're going to need to monitor your application in you know, 2020 is not the same as what you needed in 2015 or, or, or 2010. And we felt very strongly that this new wave was was going to be called observability. It it brings a tear to my eye to hear a Werner talk about it because as much as we observe, you know, believe that we can do big things in future, it, it's the big vendors today that can move markets. And so to hear Amazon and, and Werner in particular talk about observability, I think it lends more credence to the topic. Um, we think that organizations should have observability teams. We think there should be a head of observability. And again, you know, Amazon endorsing this, uh, I think means that there's a much stronger chance that that's going to happen. And they're going to start, start to shine a light on, I think a topic that almost everybody needs to pay attention to as they build their next generation of applications. When you guys, I know you guys are launched and you have a couple of paying customers now and growing rapidly, um, well-funded, um, uh, get some great investors, the, found, uh, the, the investors of Snowflake also um, invested in you guys. So they see this cloud trend, I'll see Snowflake went public and I know you're on the board of Snowflake as well. So you, you, you know a little bit about what's going on with Amazon and the opportunity. When you look at observability, okay, you're building a business around it. And again, you think about head of observability, that's not like a small thing when you make, put someone in charge of something. So why do you say that? I mean, what, I mean, you know, some would say, you know, hey, it's a feature, not a company. I mean, you, this is two mindsets that are different. How do you address that? 
Yeah, the the the, the thing I'd say is is look, the, the number one job in America is um, is is a software engineer is writing code. The number two job is fixing it. And and so you know the, the the job. Think about that for a second. The job of fixing our applications is almost as big as the job of creating our applications. Uh, like something has to change, right? I, I know the job of fixing cars is not as big as the auto industry. Why? Because over time that industry has matured and there are better tools to you know diagnose cars, uh, and so they they become easy to fix over time. We've we've not made that leap with our applications. Um, the tools that the engineering team use to debug and troubleshoot their application are often still very different to what the DevOps team is using, um, which is very different to what maybe the SRE team um, is using. And, and, and so it's a huge problem in our industry, um, really not being able to diagnose and troubleshoot issues uh, when they arise. It, it costs the industry a fortune. It costs, you know, sort of in, in direct wasted productivity of development teams, but it also costs in terms of customer experience. Um, I mean, you know, you and I both know is, look, if we're, if we're having a bad experience with, with maybe a new service that we're trying out online, we're, we're, we're probably going to go somewhere else. And so the, there's never been like a more important time for people to invest in observing the entire environment, the entire customer experience not only will you have happier customers, you, you might actually reduce the costs and improve the productivity in your engineering team as well. So I, I feel like the opportunity there is 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 vast. Um, I, I also think longer term, um, it doesn't just apply to troubleshooting distributed applications. Um, I think the, the the security systems are very related to the way we build software. Um, I mean, I think in, in, in the news in recent days, we've, we've become attuned uh, uh, to, to software defects um, or malware in software causing breaches in government agencies. Um, hey, that, that could be anybody's software right there. Yeah. And so security has got a, a role to play in observability and the customer experience, it doesn't stop when they have a bad experience on the website. What if they complain? You know, I'm gonna what if a help desk ticket get? I'm going to. How, how do you track that? How do you track? Yeah, I'm going to. I have a lot of questions for Jassy tomorrow. One of them I'm going to ask him, and I want to get your thoughts on it because you brought that up, and I think it's a, a key point. You know, building applications and supporting them and fixing them it kind of reminds me of the old adage of, um, you know, you know, you, you got to run IT, running the operations. Seventy percent of the budget is using to running IT. If you look at what's happening. And if you talk to customers, and this is what I'm going to ask Jassy tomorrow, Werner actually talked about uh, day two operations in his keynote. Yeah. I mean, this is Amazon, they're, they're targeting builders. And so I talked to um, a few other entrepreneurs um, who have growing companies and some CIOs and CEOs, and the basic enterprises, they don't want to be building things. Like they, that's not their DNA. They don't build things. Like that's not what they do. I mean, first of all, I love the builder mentality and with Amazon. Um, but they might be at a time where there might not be enough builders, Jeremy, right out there. So you got skill shortages and then ultimately are enterprises really builders? Yeah, they'll build something, but then they just run it. Right? So, so at what point do they stop building or they build their own thing in yeah. the cloud and then they got to run it. So I think yeah. Amazon is going to shift quickly to day two operations. Yeah, build, 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 run, run, run. Yeah, it's a great topic of conversation. I think what, what you're sort of poking at is, is sort of the maturation of this digital age and the state that we're at. Um, I mean, if you if you go back, you know, to you know, 10, 10, 20 years, um, I mean, look at the mid 90s. Um, there, there were a lot of people building custom applications, right? I mean, you know, IT was innovation. It was all about building custom apps. And I think that golden era of application development back there now um, and, and customers in order to get competitive advantage, they are building their own applications. When you talk about digital transformation, what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, often a traditional company building a new digital experience for services that they've potentially offered in a physical way uh, in the past. So make no mistake, pe people are builders or they are writing code, they are becoming digital. I think what you'll find at some point as the industries mature, some of these digital experiences become packaged. And so you can buy those off the shelf. And so there's less building required. 
But I think as we sit today, um, that there's probably more code been written in anger by more organizations than at any point in the last 30 years. And, and I think this is another reason why observability is so important. Um, as you're building that code and as you're developing that customer experience, you want to be able to understand um, where the issues are and, and um, uh, like along the way, you don't want to wait till there's a, a, a big customer disaster on the day of you roll that something to production before you start investigating. You want to do that as you go. Yeah, and I think that's a kill. I do agree with you, by the way. I think the there is a builder mentality, but it's fragrant. But remember those days back in IT, so if you want to put our, our time machine hat on and go through the time machine is, you know, that was during the mainframe client server transition and it was called spaghetti code. You know, it's like the monoliths were built and then had to be supported and that became legacy. So, and, and I kind of see that happening today where um, people are moving to the cloud, they are building, but at some point you got to build your thing in the cloud. If I'm a company, mm -hmm. again, this is some, some dots I'm trying to connect in real time. I got serverless, which is totally cool. I'm going to have quantum as headroom for compute. I'm going to have um, kind of a, a SOA, server-oriented architecture with web services and with observability. I'm going to have all these modern apps, great. Yeah. They got to run them. And I'm now I've got to shift to multiple clouds. So, you know, maybe the private cloud waves coming back, you're seeing telco clouds. You start to see these new tier, I won't say tier two clouds, but I mean, people will build their own cloud environment. There's no doubt it's going to the cloud. And Steve Mullaney at Aviatrix kind of made this point yesterday in his analysis where he's like, he thinks private cloud will be back. It'll just, it'll just be public cloud. People will build their own clouds and run them. Yeah, I feel, I feel what, what happens over time is, is the, the, the sort of line above which you would add value rises. So I kind of feel like, look, cloud is just going to be the infrastructure. We can debate, you know, private cloud, public cloud, is it a public cloud or, or is it a private cloud served up by a public cloud provider? My view is, is look, all of that is, is um, just going to be commodity. Right, um, it, it's going to be served up for an ever decreasing cost. And so then it's incumbent on organizations to, to innovate above that line. And you know, 20 years ago, you know, <laughs> we, we built our own data centers um, and, and now increasingly that, that seeming like a crazy idea. Um, and you know, now you can get almost all of your infrastructure from the cloud. The, the great thing is, I mean, look at Observe, we have no people running data center operations, none. Yeah. Right. We have no people building a database. None. You know, we use Snowflake in the cloud. It runs on AWS. We have we have one DevOps uh, engineer, and and so all the people in the company right now are focused on adding value, helping people you know understand and analyze data uh, above that line. And we just pay for a service level. And and look, as time goes by, there's going to be more and more services, and that line's going to rise. And so. You know, what, what, what I care about and what I think a lot of CEOs care about is are most of my resources innovating above that sort of value creation line? Um, because that's what people are going to pay for in our business. And I think that's what's going to represent, you, you know, sort of value add for, you, you know, organizations big and small. You know, that brought up a good point. I want to shift to the next topic and then we'll get into some observability questions I have for you and update on your company. Um, complexity has been a big theme that's come out of all the conversations with analysts that have come on the cube as you hear it with Amazon. A lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting being abstracted away to your point about value layers and competing on value. Amazon mm -hmm. continues to do that, all great stuff. But some are saying, and we had said on the cube yes, two days ago, you put the complexity behind the curtain, it's still complexity, right? So, so complexity with the edge is highlighted, uh, even though they got green uh, I, um, edge core or green grass, which is core thing, IOT core, a lot of cool things happening, but it's still not yet super easy. So mm -hmm. complexity tends to slow things down, became friction. What's your view on this? Because taming the complexity seems to be a post COVID pandemic mandate for um, cloud journeys. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I think in certainly you look organizations that have been in existence for you know 30, 40 years or maybe even 10 years. Look, that there's an amount of technical debt and complexity that you, you build up over time. Um, but even newer companies, um, the way that people are building modern distributed applications in in some respects is is more complex than in days gone by. You, you know, microservices. Um, 
some of which maybe you know you own, some of which maybe you don't. And and what you've got to be able to do is 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 see the big picture. You know, when 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 is something in my code, but then when am I making a call out to maybe a third party microservice and and that microservice is bailing out of me. Like, like so people have got to see the, the the big picture. And I think what what hasn't been available as uh, people have changed the architecture and their applications, there hasn't been an equivalent set of innovation or evolution in the tools that they use to manage that environment. And so you, 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 you've got this sort of dichotomy of a, a better way for software developers to write code and deploy it into production microservices, but at the same time, you, you don't have good information and good tools to make sense of that complexity. That's great stuff. Jeremy Burton is here. Uh, he's the CEO of Observe Inc. Uh, Cube alumni, VIP Cube alumni, by the way. He's been on the Cube every year since the Cube has been around 2010 when he took the new job as the CMO of EMC prior to being bought by Dell. Jeremy, you're a legend in, in the industry, uh, certainly on as an executive and a marketer and as an entrepreneur. Um, I got to ask you, Observe Inc., your company now, um, you're right in the middle of all this. You, mm -hmm. you got a big uh, bet going on. Could you share in your opinion, your words, what is the big bet that you're making with Observe Inc? Uh, what are you betting on? How do you see the preferred future uh, unfolding? And where are you guys going to capture that value? Yes, our, our, our big bet here really is to take a new approach um, in, in, in terms of enabling people to observe their systems. The, the, the term observability actually goes back uh, to a guy in control systems theory in the 60s. And, and, in, and it, it's got a quite a simple definition, which is, you know, being able to determine the, uh, or being able to diagnose a system by the telemetry data that it emits. So let's look at the external outputs and then based on that, can I determine the internal state of the application? And so from the get-go, we felt like observability was not about building another tool, right? We're not, you know, it's not about building another monitoring tool or logging tool. Um, it, it's about analyzing data. And I, I was struck many years ago, uh, I spent a bit of time with, with Andy McAfee uh, from the CSAIL lab at MIT. And he, he made a statement that I thought at the time was quite profound, which he said, look, everything's a matter of data. If you have enough data, you can solve any problem. And that, that stuck with me for a long time. And um, you know, observe really what we do is we ingest vast quantities of telemetry data we treat everything as events and, and, and we try and make sense of it. And the economics of the infrastructure now is such that is you truly can ingest all your tele telemetry data and it's affordable, right? I mean, one of the wonderful things that Amazon has done is they brought you, you know, very cheap, affordable storage. You can ingest all your data and keep it forever. Um, but, but now can you make sense of it? Well, you know, compute is pretty cheap these days and you've got amazing processing engines like Snowflake. And so our sense was that if we could allow folks to ingest all of this telemetry data, uh, process that data and help people easily analyze that data, then they could find almost any problem that existed uh, in their applications or in their infrastructure. So we really set out to create a data company, which I think is fundamentally different to, to really what everybody else is doing. And today we're troubleshooting distributed applications, but I, I think in future, we, my hope is that we can, we can help people analyze almost anything around their applications or infrastructure. And what's the use case problem statement that you're entering the market on? Is it just uh, making sure microservices can be deployed? Is it Kubernetes? Is it managing containers? Is there a specific um, customer adoption use case that you're focused on right now? Yeah, we've tried to target our ideal customer, if you like, has been the, the three or 4,000 uh, uh, SaaS companies. Uh, we're, we're really focused on the US right now, but three to 4,000 SaaS companies, um, predominantly, obviously running on, on AWS, often a Kubernetes infrastructure, but you know, people who are having a hard time uh, understanding the complexity of the application that they've created and they're, they're having a hard time understanding uh, the experience that their customers are having and, and tracking that back to root cause. So you know, really helping those SaaS companies troubleshoot their applications and having a better customer experience. That, that's where the early customers are. And if we can do a good job in that area, I think we can, you know, over time, you know, start to take on some of the bigger companies and, and maybe some of the more established companies that are moving in this, this digital direction. 
Jeremy, thanks for sharing that. And I got some, one last set of questions for you around the industry. But before I get there, give a quick plug for Observe. What are you guys looking to do higher? I mean, give a quick uh, uh, PSA on what's going on with Observe. Yeah, so we're, uh, the company is now what, rough and tough about three years old. We got about 40 people. Uh, we're well funded by Sutter Hill Ventures. Uh, they were the original investors in, in Snowflake. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've well, more than doubled in size since the COVID lockdown began. We had about 15 people when that began. We've got almost 40 now. Um, and I would anticipate in the next year, we're, we're probably going to double in size again, but um, yeah, really the core focus in the company is, is understanding and, and analyzing vast quantities of data. And so anybody who is interested in uh, that space, look us up. Looking for mainly any areas, obviously engineering, any other areas that will come for opening? Engineering all over. I mean, we, you know, we, we, as you'll see, if you go to observing.com, we've got a pretty slick front end uh, we invested very early on in design, in UX design. So we believe that UI can be a differentiator. Uh, we've, so we've got some amazing engineers on the front end. Uh, so can, can always do with the help there. But obviously, um, you know, there's a data processing platform here as well. Um, we, uh, we do run on top of Snowflake. We, we do have a number of folks here who are very familiar, uh, you know, with the Snowflake database and, and how to write efficient SQL. So, so front end, back end, um, we very soon, I think we'll be starting to expand the sales team. Um, we're really starting to get our initial set of customers and the feedback loop rolling, uh, you know, rolling into engineering. And my hope would be, you know, probably early part of next year, we really, we really start to nail the product market fit. Um, and we've got a huge release coming in the early part of, of next year where the, the metrics and alerting functionality will be in the product. So yeah, it's, it, it's sort of all systems go right now. Congratulations, love to see the entrepreneurial journey. We'll keep an eye out for you and uh, you're in a hot space. So we'll be riding, you'll be riding that wave. Uh, question for you on the, um, just kind of the industry. Uh, you're in the, in the heart of Silicon Valley, like I am. Obviously I'm in Palo Alto, you're up in the Hillsboro area. Um, I think you're in Hillsboro, right? That's where you, where you live. Yeah. Um, San Francisco, the Valley, the pandemic, pretty hard hit right now. People are sheltering in place, but still a lot of activity. Um, yeah. What are you hearing in, um, in, the, in the VC circles, startup circles, as everyone looks at coming out of the pandemic and you look at yeah. Amazon and you look at what Snowflake has done. I mean, Snowflake was built on top of Amazon competing against Redshift. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, they were hugely successful at doing that. So there's kind of this new playbook emerging. What are, what are people talking about? What's the scuttlebutt? Yeah, I mean, clearly, Tech has done very well throughout what has been, you know, like a, just a terrible environment. Um, I, I think both kind of socially and, 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 and economically. And I think what's going on in the stock market right now is probably not reflective of the, of the economic situation. And I think a lot of the indices are dominated by tech companies. So you, if you're not careful, you can get a little bit of a false read. Um, but look, what, what is undisputed is, is that the world is going to become more digital, more tech centric than, than less. Um, so I think there is a very, very bright future, you know, for tech. Um, there, there is certainly plenty of VC money um, available. Um, you, you know, that has not really changed materially in the last year. Um, so if you have a good idea, if you're on one of these major trends, I think there, there is a very good chance that you can get the company funded. Um, and, you know, our, our expectation is that, you know, next year, obviously industries are going to return to work that have been dormant maybe for the last six or nine months. And so some parts of the economy should pick up again. But I would also tell you, I think certain uh, sort of habits are not going to die. I, 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 I mean, I, I think more things are going to be done online and, We've gotten used to that way of working, and and you know what? Not some of it is miserable. I don't know about cocktails over Zoom, but working with customers um, in some respects is easier because they're not traveling. We're not traveling, so we both have more time. Uh, it's sometimes easier to get meetings with people that you would never get. Now, now, can you do an efficient sales process, education, proof of concept? you know, th th those processes maybe have to grow up a little bit to be taken online. But I think there's certain parts of the last maybe six or nine months that we don't want to throw away and go back to the way we were doing it, because I think, you know, maybe this way of doing it is is, is more efficient. What do you think about the uh, entrepreneurial journeys out there? Obviously, um, Amazon, we're here covering reInvent. 
is really kind of you know building a massive compute engine. They got higher level services. And you know, I've been speculating for years, I think Snowflake is the first kind of big sign that points to kind of what I said like five years ago, which is there's going to be an opportunity for these other clouds, specialty clouds, I called them. Not made the wrong word, but Snowflake basically built on top of Amazon, became you know, most valuable company ever on the Wall Street uh, IPO on someone else's cloud. So is that a playbook? I mean, is that a move? I mean, this is kind of like a new thing. Do you yeah, think it's a chance? I mean, I mean, I, I feel like you know, on databases, I've got a lot of history. I mean, as an Oracle, almost ten years, and you know what, what Snowflake do, did, did was they they rearchitected the database explicitly for the cloud. I mean, you you can run Oracle on the cloud, but but it but it doesn't do things the way that Snowflake does it, right? I mean, Snowflake uses commodity storage. It uses S3. It's elastic, and so when you're not using it, you're not paying it. And, and these things sound very simple and very obvious now, which is I think what 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 the genius of the founders, you know, Benoit and, and, and Thierry uh, uh, were. And and I think there will be other cas you know categories of infrastructure that will get rearchitected and reinvented for the cloud, and you, you know have got equally big opportunities. Um, and and so yeah, I mean I think the model I, I believe firmly that the, the the model is if you're a startup you don't need to waste a lot of time like reinventing the wheel on data center infrastructure and databases and a lot of the services that you would use to construct an application. You know, you, you can start, you know, if, if, if the building that you're trying to build is like 12 floors, you can start at the eighth or ninth floor. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've got like, the, there's what, three or 400 quality engineers at Snowflake that are building our database. I don't, I don't need to do that. I can just piggyback on top of what they've done and add value. And you know, the, the, the beautiful thing, you know, now if you're a business out there thinking of, 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 of becoming digital and reinventing yourself or you're a startup just getting going, there's a lot of stuff you just don't have to build anymore. You just don't even have to think about it. Yeah, yeah this is the new programmable internet. It's internet truly 2.0 or 3.0, whatever, 4.0, a complete reset of online. And I think the pandemic, as mm -hmm. you pointed out on many CUBE interviews and Andy Jassy sent his keynote, is on full display right now. Mm -hmm. And I think the smart money and smart entrepreneurs are going to see the opportunities. And yeah, it comes back to ideas and a great, I mean, I've always been a product person, um, but it, look, a great idea, a great product idea and a great product idea that, that capitalizes on the big trends in the industry. I think there's always going to be funding for those kind of things. I don't know a lot about the consumer world. I've always worked in, in B2B, but um, you know, the kind of things that you're going to be able to do in future. I mean, think about it, if storage is essentially free and compute is essentially free, just imagine what you could do, right? Jeremy, and that's where enterprise we're is the new consumer. Get on, let's understand that. Let's <laughs> finally, B2B <laughs> is the new consumer. Enterprise is hot. I was, again, I was riffing on this all week. All the things going on in enterprise is complex, is now the new consumer. It's now all connected. It's all one thing. The consumerization yeah. of IT, the conversation of computing has happened. It's going on. So you're a leader. Thank you for coming on. Great to see you as always. Um, say hi to your family and stay safe. Yeah, you too. Thanks for the invite. Always, always a pleasure. Jeremy Burton, breaking down the analysis of day two of week three of reInvent coverage. I'm John Furrier. We're theCUBE virtual. We're not in person anymore. Virtualization has allowed us to do more interviews, over 110 interviews so far for reInvent and tomorrow, Thursday at two o'clock, Andy Jassy will spend 30 minutes with me here on theCUBE, looking back at reInvent, the highs, the lows, and what's next for Amazon Web Services. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.